Okay, in our next slide, we're going to be talking about factoring using the FAST method. And FAST is an acronym that I came up with, which stands for Factoring a Simple Trinomial. And it's simple because the leading coefficient is positive 1. So let's take a look at number 9 as an example. I'm very certain that you've done this type of factoring before, so I'll go through these quickly. What I like to do first when I'm going to use FAST factoring is focus on the constant at the end. So in number 9, that would be 36. And what I like to do is make a very organized list of all the factor pairings of 36. So I'm going to start making that list right now. So I've made the list, and that includes 1 and 36, 2 and 18, 3 and 12, 4 and 9, 6 and 6. Of all these pairings, though, I need to find the, the pair that's going to give me a difference of 9, because 9 is in the middle. It's the linear coefficient. So of all these pairings, the one that's going to give me a difference of 9 are the 3 and the 12. So I'm going to circle that pairing as my winner. And now I'm going to decide on what the signs are going to be, the pluses and the minuses. Now I know the product has to be negative 36, which, mean there, which means there has to be 1 plus and 1 minus. And I also have to have a sum of negative 9. What that's going to mean is that the minus is going to go with the 12, and the plus is going to go with the 3. Now just as a double check, let's multiply those two numbers together. 3 and a negative 12 give you a negative 36, and 3 plus a negative 12 give you a negative 9. So this is in fact our winning pair, signs and everything. So how do we translate this into our final answer? Well, it's very simple. I'm going to construct two binomials that will each start with the variable used in the problem, which in this case is x. And each binomial will end with the, the winning numbers that we've picked. So the final answer here is going to be x plus 3 and x minus 12. Now when you're done with a problem like this and you're not completely certain of your answer, you could always FOIL to check to make sure that you've done it right. Let's try number 11 as a second example. So again, I'm going to start by focusing on the constant at the end, which is 100. And I'm going to create a very organized list of all the factor pairings of 100. Okay, so I've created my list and it includes 1 times 100, 2 and 50, 4 and 25, 5 and 20, 10 and 10. Now of all those pairings, I have to pick the one that's going to give me a sum of 25, because that's what the linear coefficient is. And that's going to happen if I pick 5 and 20. Now I've got to think about the positives and negatives. Because it ends in a positive 100, that tells me that both of the signs have to be the same. They can be both positive or both negative. But because the middle term is positive, that tells me that they both have to be positive. So I'm going to put a plus in front of the 5 and the 20. And as a double check, I'll multiply these two values, which gives me a 100, and I'll add these two values, which gives me a 25. So this is going to work. I'm now going to set up my winning binomials. The variable I'm using is z, so that's what's going to go in the front end of each of these binomials. The binomials will end with the winning values that I picked, the winning factors, which are plus 5 and plus 20. So here is the factored form of this trinomial. Again, if you wanted to, you could FOIL to check. So I've done numbers 9 and 11 for you to refresh. I'd like you to do number 10 and number 12. If you need to pause the video, that's fine. Resume the video when you're done. So the next slide, we're going to review the Nobes method. And the Nobes method is a method that we use at our school because it was discovered by one of our teachers with that last name. So in the Nobes method, you've got a trinomial, but this time the leading coefficient is not 1. And this is generally a more challenging case. So you'll notice if you scan through the four problems on this slide, that in no case is the leading coefficient 1. We've got a 2, a 10, a 12, and another 12. So this is going to add an extra layer of complication. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by multiplying the first and last numbers together. So in number 13, we're going to get 2 times negative 6, which is negative 12. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Now I'm going to make a very organized list of all the factor pairings of negative 12. Okay, amongst these three pairings, I need to pick the winner, which is the one that's going to give me a difference of 1. And the reason I'm picking a difference of 1 is because the middle term has a coefficient of 1. So I'm going to pick 3 and 4. The difference between those numbers is 1. But now I've got to figure out positives and negatives. So the product has to be negative 12, which tells me the signs need to be different. But when I add, I need to get a positive 1. So I think it's going to be a negative 3 and a positive 4. I'll multiply those values together, which give me a negative 12. And I'll add those values together, which gives me a 1. 
See, these are the right numbers. Now, the next thing that I do is going to seem a little weird. I'm going to create two fractions. And the denominators of those fractions are going to be the winning numbers that I just selected. So the denominators are going to be negative 3 and 4. Notice how I write the positive just for emphasis. Some students will omit that, but I think it's a good idea to leave it. And you might see why in a second. Now you might be wondering what, what goes in the numerator. The numerator is going to be the first term, the quadratic term, but you're going to drop the squared. So you're going to write 2x and 2x. And now what you're going to do is you're going to read those fractions downward, and you're also going to reduce if possible. This is a little weird, but once you get used to it, it's an amazing technique, and it works every single time. So if we look at this first fraction here, 2 and a negative 3, or thinking of, thinking of it as negative 2 thirds, that fraction cannot be reduced. So I'm going to write 2x minus 3. Now when I look at our second fraction, we have a 2 and a 4, and 2 fourths can reduce to 1 half. So instead of thinking about this as 2x plus 4, I'm going to think about it as 1x plus 2 because I've just reduced by a factor of 2. Now, it's really encouraged that for this method you do a FOIL to check because every year that I've taught this, and it's been a couple decades now, students always struggle with this one. They, they really seem confident that they get it right and then they screw up the signs or they've picked the wrong factors. So just to play it safe, take a moment and, and FOIL that out. Even do it right now in your head for this problem. Okay, let's go on to number 15. To start number 15, again, I'm going to start by multiplying the first and last numbers together. 12 times 3 is 36. Now I'm going to make a very neat and organized list of all factor pairings of 36. Okay, so I chose 1 times 36, 2 and 18, 3 and 12, 4 and 9, 6 and 6. I need to find the pairing that's going to give me a middle term that's going to be a sum of negative 13. As I look at my options here, I think I'm going to pick the 4 and the 9. 4 and 9 multiply to 36, but when added, they give me 13. But I actually need negative 13, so I'm going to make them both negative. Now let's do a quick check. If I multiply negative 4 and negative 9, I get the positive 36 that I needed from the beginning, and I get the negative 13 that I need for the middle. So these are the winning numbers. Now it's time to set up my fractions. The denominators of my fractions are going to be the winning numbers that I've circled, negative 4 and negative 9. Now I'm going to focus on the quadratic term, and I'm going to circle it, but I'm going to x out the squared. So my numerators of these fractions are going to be 12y, 12y. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these fractions downward, reducing if I can, and that's going to help me create my binomials. Looking at the first fraction, I realize I can divide the top and the bottom by 4. And if I do that, I get 3y minus 1. When I look at the second fraction, I realize I can divide both the top and bottom by 3. And if I do that, I get 4y minus 3. And again, because this is new for some of you, you might want to FOIL to check just, to, just so you can boost your confidence and make sure you're doing it correctly. So I've done number 13 and 15 for you as sample problems. I'd like you to do 14 and 16 right now. So pause the video and resume it when you're done. Okay, in this slide, we're going to be discussing the perfect square trinomial, or the PST, or the PST. A perfect square trinomial is a trinomial in which the first and last terms are perfect squares. So the first and last terms are things that I can take the square root of. Now there's one other thing that also has to happen before you can classify this as a perfect square trinomial. The last term has to be positive. So if you look right now at all four problems, the last term is positive. If the last term is not positive, then it's not a perfect square trinomial. Okay, so what I'm going to do to factor this is I'm going to set up a binomial, and that binomial is going to be squared, and I'm going to do a test, and I'm going to show you what the test is. If you're thinking that you might have a perfect square trinomial, I want you to take the square root of the first term and write it down. Well, the square root of x squared is x, and now you're going to go to the last term, and you're going to take its square root, and you're going to write it down. Well, the square root of 16 is 4. Now you're going to multiply and double. If you multiply the x and the 4 together, you get 4x. And then if you double that, you get 8x. And that's what we have in the middle. And what that tells me is that we do have, in fact, a perfect square trinomial. Look, there's even a little happy face because they're very happy that that happened. The last thing we have to do is just put a plus or minus in there. And in this case, because the middle term is negative, we're going to put a minus right here. 
Okay, so this is an example of a perfect square trinomial, and it's a very easy factoring technique if it passes the test. Let's do another one in number 19. So I look at number 19, it's a trinomial, it ends with a plus, the first and last terms are perfect squares, so I'm strongly thinking this is a perfect square trinomial, so I'm going to set it up and do a little test. Okay, the square root of the first term, the square root of a squared is a, the square root of 81b squared is 9b. If I multiply these two things together, I get 9ab. And if I double that, I get 18ab, which is precisely what I have in the middle. So it's past the test. I know for a fact that I have a perfect square trinomial. Now again, it's time to decide whether to make it plus or minus. Well, because of this minus here for the middle term, that sort of dictates what the sign's going to be. So it's going to be the quantity a minus 9b squared. And again, if you're not completely sure or confident in this method, you can always take a stab at it, and then you could foil it out to check to make sure that you're doing it correctly. So I've done number 17 and 19 as sample problems. I'd like you to stop the video and do numbers 18 and 20 on your own. Resume the video when you're done. Okay, for our last factoring technique, we're going to be looking at factoring by grouping. And the giveaway that I'm going to be using factoring by grouping is if the problem has four or more terms. If the problem has four or more terms, I'm really going to be considering grouping terms together in order to factor. So as we look at number 21, the first thing I notice about the expression is that there are four terms. Now when you're factoring by grouping, you can group the first two together and the last two. You might group the first and the third with the second and the fourth or you might do the outside pairing and the inside pairing. So sometimes there's a lot of different ways that you could group, but fundamentally you want to group things together such that you can factor something out and continue the whole process of factoring. So just looking at number 21, if I decide to group the first two things together, I notice that I could take out an x from the first two terms. And if I look at the second two terms, I could take out a 2. So it looks like I could just do something more with that problem. So I'm going to give it a try. I also have to be resilient, and if it doesn't work, I have to just erase it and try something else. No big deal. It's just a math problem. So what I'm going to do is rewrite problem number 21, but this time grouping the first two things together and the second two things together. Okay, it's worth noting something that happened here, and that is when I grouped the, the last two things together, I took out a negative. And because I took out a negative, it changed the sign of all things beyond it. So that chunk, 2y squared plus 2, looks a little bit different from how it originally started. So just take a moment and distribute the negative back through in your head, just to make sure it is the original problem. So think about that. The opposite of 2y squared is negative 2y squared, which is what I started with here. And the opposite of positive 2 is negative 2. So the way that I extracted this negative, that was, that was done correctly. But it's often a, a confusing point for students. Just be, be aware of that. Okay, so now that I've grouped the first two things together and the last two things together, I'm going to ask myself, well, what could I take out of each of those groups? Well, from group number one, I could take out an x. And from group number two, I could take out a 2. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Okay, now that I've taken out the x from group 1 and the 2 from group 2, I notice that there's a y squared plus 1 left in each grouping. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the y squared plus 1 that exists in both of those bigger terms. So I'm going to extract or remove or factor out the y squared plus 1. When I take out the y squared plus 1, what am I left with? If you guessed x minus 2, you're correct. So we've just done our first factoring by grouping question, and if you wanted to check, you could multiply those two binomials together using the FOIL method to see that you get what you started with.